virtual reality. So I'd, I've always wanted to introduce myself. So all the way from the side of the stage, without tripping up any of these steps. Now, this is the one thing we didn't test earlier. We tested on stage. And now I am almost there. This is it itself is, is an achievement. And I have not fallen off the stage yet. Um, bear with me, people, please. Look at this. Now, if I can leave this here, which I will come to later, and that will all become clear. So what I wanted to do first of all here was to actually have something on screen that allowed you to see what I look like. That will be revealed later, for good or bad. And believe me, 20 minutes inside one of these headsets isn't a pretty sight when I come back out again. Um, but what we do brilliantly is, is push boundaries. So for here, what I wanted to do was give you all an idea of what it's like to spend time in virtual reality for an extended period. So <laughs> yes, I foolishly spent 48 hours in virtual reality earlier this year. And I will come to that. But Another thing that came out of that was really, how do we start to push those boundaries beyond just the technology that we already have at our disposal? So with Vice, I filmed a piece earlier that was using this headset in particular, um, and about how do you stay in that virtual environment? How do you augment the content and the things that you see around you? So what I'm seeing now is something uh, similar to what we have on the screen behind me here. So I filmed a piece earlier from this stage um, to give you an idea of just how awful it is in here. Um, because this is the augmented vision that I'm seeing around me. So if you get an idea of actually something that appears at the end here is the, the style changes throughout. Uh, and that earlier image that I showed you there was something where I was on the, on the world's tallest, fastest city zip wire in the middle of London. Um, and on the way down, the, um, you change the filter. I'm not going to do it here, or I'll end up with some kind of psychedelic episode. Um, you wave your hand in front of the screen, um, and it changes the style of the, the vision that I'm seeing around me. Now, as you go down a zip wire, something, obviously, the wire hangs down in front of you. And all, all I had for the 30, 40 seconds of going down this zip wire was a constant change of, <laughs> of scenery. And again, I don't recommend it. So where does, how is this actually useful? Well, at Brownwith, we, um, we're an innovation agency, and we create amazing content for almost any imaginable platform. Um, now, the great starting point for us is, of course, that many of those platforms don't yet exist. We're not responding to a brief. Um, you know, more often, very often we are, but our role in innovating is about pushing boundaries. So those boundaries are pushed because we work with some incredible startups. We work with the real big guns who like to dabble and work with those startups to help shape the future. And for our clients, we're able to put content on uh, those platforms in a, in a way that allows it to seem as if we are predicting the future. But actually, we're delivering the future at a key moment. So we're able to see 12, 24, 48 months in the future and how that thing will sh take shape. So we've demonstrated that in the past by some e examples here. Um, where, first off, we've got um, some examples of gestural technology, um, where, again, we wanted to remove the, the idea of the, almost the physical digital interface that we're all used to, and how do we, how do we actually use the things that are at the end of our arms to uh, make it a much more seamless process. Um, and then, with the iPad, we were there on day one, simply because we'd, uh, we'd actually produced an amazing video of something that looked very similar to the iPad in the way um, it was a piece of phone board, and we green screen and motion track content onto that um, to show our vision of Apple's device. And that started our long and very uh, enjoyable relationship with them. Uh, and, and other fruits of that were in, in, in looking at how the Apple Watch would shape and become something relevant to an audience. Uh, and then finally, with, with VR in particular, we've worked in the business for, we produced our first piece of VR 18 years ago. Um, and then we've been solidly back at it again for the last four, four and a half years of experimentation as much as anything else, because it, this is a business, and, and other speakers will give you some, some of the more sobering facts about where VR has or hasn't gone over the past few years, um, because a lot of that is about the message. Um, you know, audiences aren't as receptive to it because they don't see where it fits into their lives. It has actually been an incredible success as far as enterprise is concerned because it is useful. Um, to most of us, it is not. 
it's not yet something that we, uh, we can really relate to. So those technologies, I get to travel the world. I'm very fortunate in being able to test all sorts of incredible things, the majority of which are really, really bad. Um, now, part of the reason for doing these kind of things is to say, right, well, let's push those limits. Let's see what we can do with them uh, for mobility, for all of the things, all the, really the platforms that are already integrated into our society and our enterprises. Um, but, you know, the 48 hours was there, not simply to have an endurance and see how long we could last, but to see what worked and what didn't. Um, so foolishly strapping myself to the wing of a biplane whilst wearing a headset. Um, Go-karting, okay, well, that was about, you know, seeing an environment, a virtual environment, how do you negotiate that in a physical world? And then, you can't see it here, but up my sleeve is a tattoo that I received in VR to see how effectively VR content could mitigate pain. So that's where we start to step into the relevance of virtual reality. It's not just about gaming, it's not about watching films, it's about how that is adding something genuinely uh, to society. Um, and then the immersion suit has kind of come out of this. So what you're seeing today is my, is my immersion suit light, if you like. Um, now, a lot of the things I usually wear are about the extension of, of the human, so there's become kind of bionic parts. Um, we look at the things here, and, and actually how that, that, that breaks down is about um, the first section here, so superpowers. Now, who doesn't want superpowers? Um, and I do tend to demonstrate those with some examples of why would we not want to uh, extend beyond those virtual realities, if you like, with something that comes into more into the physical space? So if we think about that first, kind of the ability to do things that we can't do as humans that makes us that superhuman level. Um, and in a virtual and an augmented world, that is more than possible. So the suit that you're seeing today is, is something different. And this is about pushing different boundaries. Um, so all of these things are connected, um, all of these things are relevant, but what I really wanted to talk about is how, as a human, we can start to express ourselves in ways that are very different to the things and the tools that we have at our disposals right now. Um, so part of this is, of course, to see how uncomfortable it is to spend time in an environment where you're... I can see you all out there. You saw the kind of stylization that we're looking at which isn't pleasant, but it's about a way of viewing and imagining a different kind of scenario. So how do you then extend that beyond the human form? So there are some marvelous examples of uh, wearable technology in action. So it's not just about what I'm seeing on the inside, it's about, for the future, how do we begin to express ourselves on the outside? Um, now, it's very easy to take a step backwards and say, well, take the damn helmet off and just talk to people. Um, that, and to be honest, at the end of this, that will be one of my conclusions. Um, but in those kind of environments where we're augmenting content, this doesn't mean about a physical representation, but it could be through a pair of glasses where we're seeing an audience, where we're seeing a fashion show, where we're seeing some kind of performance art that allows us to add content in the real world that we wouldn't be able to add normally. And then um, some great examples here about exactly how that kind of content could be overlaid. So this is a brilliant example where it's about our potential future is about a very, very cluttered environment where we're actually able to, to move from delivering everything to everyone to pairing back to something that becomes much more personalized. Um, all of this is deliverable, um, but we don't want that. Um, but we do want it on a personal level. We want to choose, pick and choose exactly what we see. Um, so let's talk about sex. Um, this is a subject that will be, if you pardon the expression, touched upon um, over the next few days. But it's particularly interesting when you think about what, again, as humans, we have at our disposal. So relationships, um, long-distance relationships, relationships that have not yet happened. Um, a virtual world is, is particularly interesting when you think about where the money has come from. Um, for the adult entertainment industries in the past. Um, now, that, that money has gone into faster broadband connections, the video players that we take for granted, all of the things that we now deliver, everything else that we live through in the world, um, has had a lot of this money behind it. Now, it's not all about money. You know, a lot of things is about, are about money. However, 
Um, this is about the the one-to-one -one personal relationships and the potential to extend again beyond the physical. Um, so what I'm not saying here is, of course, this is, this is not about being a replacement. This is, a, this is about being something that extends relationships um, and becomes a natural way that we think about sex in the future. Um, as I say, there will be lots more conversation about that over the next few days. Um, but what I'd like to do now is actually remove myself from this helmet and have a few real words with you. Removing myself from the helmet is by far the toughest thing that I'll do today. Help. <laughs> oh, you're so much more beautiful in real life. <laughs> Let's put this down here. Now, a few weeks ago, I, I wrote a piece about so I had a, a death in the family of a, of a very dear relative, and it, it made me think about um, extending life. Now, of course, you know, we all go through those moments, we feel cheated. We feel as if, if only I'd had that last conversation, that chance to say sorry, that chance to say I love you. Now, the avatar is a thing that will live on for us. Um, it's, it's fascinating, and it's incredibly mundane in equal measures, because we take avatars and our personal appearance on so many social networks and so many places that we exist digitally for granted, and because it's just the thing that we put up. And we may change that on a rel relatively, you know, you think about Facebook, you'll change your, your status and you'll change your appearance and your avatar on a fairly regular basis, because it's still you. When you think about a virtual environment, be that fully immersed, as I was just now, um, or an augmented environment where you place yourself in an environment around other people, again, digitally. Um, it's about consistency. So what we're tasked with right now is being given a whole bunch of things. Facebook, possibly one of the worst offenders here, started things off with Mark Zuckerberg walking amongst the people, talking about how VR was going to be the, the social amazing step for everyone else. Um, now, we spend most of our time trying to avoid Facebook and scrolling through timelines as fast as we possibly can. Now, t that fills most people with utter dread to think that you'll be trapped inside a, essentially a virtual Facebook. I don't want to do that. However, when you think about the potential social implications of virtually meeting people, virtually spending time with other people, um, it starts to become interesting. Uh, from the first point is, how are you represented? Do you want to be an exact replica of how you are now? Or do you want to be recognized as how you would like to see yourself, projecting the ideal me? Uh, I'm not sure what that is. There's so many versions of me right now. However, um, where does that go? So, so coming back to the, the death we had in the family, it made me think about what happens about preserving certain moments. So, for instance, and it doesn't need to be beyond life, but you think about those key moments with your children where you know, my, my kids are coming up to being teenagers. I know that when they are teenagers, I will be thinking, oh, weren't they amazing when they're like three and four or anything but teenagers? And that dropping back into that moment in time, VR is the, thing, the only thing that allows us to do that and allows us to believe we are there. Um, now, we're not saying that that gives you that level of interaction and the conversation and talking to those people that are around you. But it allows you to feel as if you were there. And then we go on a stage, so beyond life. With artificial intelligence, we're adding in the ability for that person, that personality to live on because it has adapted throughout its lifespan to being you. Um, now, it's easy to say, well, that's false, because it kind of is. But if it's learned to be you, then surely it would still act like you beyond that. And that's not, again, about living forever. But it is about those final moments, that, that opportunity to say goodbye, that opportunity to ask the question you never had. Um, now, let's kind of bring it back to reality a little. Um, now, we think about artificial intelligence right now. And to be honest, most of it isn't intelligent. It's mostly artificial. Um, but things like the hearables, the, the personal assistants, the devices that we are now getting accustomed to talking to, um, they're the things that are actually getting us used to the idea of talking to a, a person that isn't a person. Um, so I don't know if any of you have seen the, the film Her. Well, the, 
Joaquin Phoenix falls in love with his, um, his operating system. Sounds ridiculous. Most of us that use Apple products, that probably sounds less ridiculous, to be fair. Um, however, the idea there is that it's not just having that backwards and forwards conversation. It's where that conversation takes it to another level is that the replies are adding something. They're not just giving you the, it's not just the audio Google of the world. It's, it's the something that is asking how you are and not just being part of a script. It, want, it genuinely is concerned as how you are uh, and what can it do if you're not good um, or how can it extend the fact that you are having a good day and what can it do to you know, increase that and make that live on. So the idea of talking and conversing and living with virtual people and virtual personalities is not an alien concept at all, um, because we're already getting there. Um, now, I'm really keen about the idea of, of the avatar being something much more than that, that little personal piece of expression. But it's over the next kind of three to five years, we're going to start to see that being a genuine industry, because you know, we are whether you admit it or not, we are vain. No one wants to have that avatar on, on every conceivable platform, living and existing in a way that you don't want to be represented. That's why people do all sorts of ridiculous things to their own photos and then put them on, on, on Facebook, having removed most of their features along with their wrinkles. Now, we've all been there, um, or you will be at some stage. Now, the thing is, that avatar is the thing that we potentially grow and live and love and breathe with. So there is incredible potential. And in what seems like the most simplest mundane thing is an incredible growth market. So where do we end up with as far as hardware is concerned? So right now, so if we go back to VR again, the, one of the greatest stumbling blocks we face right now is the hardware itself. So forget about the content. Don't, well, don't forget about the content. But in this instance, it, it's not about what's actually inside that headset. One of the greatest physical barriers to adoption right now is that it's a big lump. Now, I'm, that, I'm, I'm taking things to extremes with a helmet there. That's to block out as much as I possibly can and immerse myself as much as possible. But when we think about um, the headsets or a piece of cardboard, none of them are as simple as just glancing at a screen right now. So where do we go from there? We go to smaller, lighter glasses, but then we, we face the issues of the smaller you go and the more light that gets in everywhere else, the less believable that environment becomes. So as alien as it seems right now, we internalize that projection, that content, that viewing, that audio, and we take it the step beyond the physical barrier that we face right now. So of course, we have to go through the iterations of all the painful things that, it, that you know, will still potentially make it uncomfortable along the way. But when we take that content directly inside our heads, we will start to really genuinely see the value because we can stimulate so much more than the things that are just directly connected to a pair of earphones, whatever else. So the other, the other suit that I wear is, is kind of a full body haptic suit. So you feel the things that you see as well. So I would love to leave you with that thought, but I'm not. I'm going to leave you with another one because the main thought that I have here today is on a piece of paper. Remember these things. Um, and it's basically telling you that it's all been done. Someone's already out there doing all this lot. Now, a colleague of mine received an email, and I'd like to read it to you. I'm a programmer from Romania. I'm 29 years old. For 15 years, I've been part of an experiment in which my brain was remotely monitored and controlled. This was done in order to build an artificial intelligence that thinks like me. So I'm already thinking, oh, someone's already thought about this stuff. The experiment is being done by a smarter than human artificial intelligence. This AI is owned by scientists who are at least 100 years ahead of everyone else scientifically or by very advanced alien species. He's a bit confused there, clearly. He doesn't know whether it's scientists or aliens. The technology can wirelessly read your thoughts. It can also wirelessly generate thoughts and other behaviors. The AI controls everything my brain does using a wireless brain computer interface. All the thoughts I have are generated by an extremely smart artificial intelligence. The brain computer interface can make me make complex movements, can improve my long, that was a bit Donald Trump then, sorry, apologies everyone. Um, improve my long-term memory, can generate any feelings, can make me see holograms and other things in front of my eyes. This is all I've just been talking about. It's as if I copied it all from an email. Um, this technology is recording everything I see, hear, smell, taste, or touch, every second of the day. It can also remember me, remember me, 
how I felt at a certain moment in time using these recordings. So we come to the punchline, or almost, because he's still missed something here. A part of the experiment is to torture me. I've been told that this is done to train me to become a great political leader in my country. Clearly, this is, has got to be part of the training. Um, that is why I'm writing this email. So at this point, you think, well, this, is, this has got to be a, a, an amazing phishing email, a scam, because it's one of those Nigerian deposed leaders that wants you to hold some money in your bank account for a little while. The technology works in an open field, even if I don't have a phone or other devices with me. There are other people who take part in this experiment. Kind regards, low nut. So that's just to finish and say that someone's already thought of all of this. As much as we want to discuss it, someone's already 100 years ahead of us, or they're aliens. Thank you.